Let's continue then with our skeletal system and our lower extremity. We had worked our way down to the leg, so we're on the tibia. The tibia is the weight-bearing bone of the lower extremity. Just how much weight can it bear before it breaks? How much does a weightlifter, a, a professional weightlifter usually weigh? 250 pounds? Okay. That's for our weightlifter. And let's say he's lifting 500 pounds. Is that reasonable? So we're up to 750. Does anybody know of a weightlifter who's weighted, who's lifted more? Anybody know any weightlifters? Oh, no? All right, but it gives you some idea of the capability of the medial bone of our leg. So the tibia is medial. And if you look at it carefully, you can see that it's triangular shaped. If I were to cut through it, I would get something like this. This is a cross section. And if you feel, you can feel sort of the apex of the triangle as you go down your leg. And you'll notice that it has no muscle on it. This area is called the shin. It has no muscle on, no muscle covering. So what are you touching when you go beneath the skin and touch the shin? What's immediately beneath the skin and between the bone and the skin? What are all bones covered with? Have you heard of periosteum? Sure. Peri means around osteum's bone. So you have periosteum beneath the skin. And what do we know about periosteum? It's filled with nerve fibers. Remember when you're a little kid and you got mad at somebody, you kicked them in the shins? Did you ever do that? I don't think you did. You look surprised at that. <laughs> you didn't do that. But it's, if you hit your shins, injure them, extremely painful because filled with nerve fibers that are right beneath the surface. So for articulation at the um, proximal end, as I work my way over on this blackboard, I see Denise and Anthony here. Is Denise here? Anybody see Denise's hand? I don't either. Does anybody see Anthony's? Anthony's, great, okay, we've got Anthony. Let me just get one more name before we go too far then and forget. Do we have Yvonne Castillo? Here, okay, after class will you come down? Thank you, both of you, fine. All right, let's continue then, sorry, but I don't want to forget. The proximal end, the tibia articulates with the femur and with the fibula. And you can see that as you look at the skeleton. Here are the condyles of the femur and the condylar surface on the tibia. And laterally is the fibula and it's articulating laterally with the tibia. Then the 
distal articulation will be an ankle bone and the ankle bone is called what? Talus, good, talus. And with the fibula. Now we see a protrusion on the <coughs> medial aspect of the distal tibia. Down here you can feel it, the swelling down there. That's the medial malleolus, the medial malleolus. What does a malleolus mean? It means hammer. I don't know that I'd use it for a hammer, but that's what it means. So you can feel the swelling down there. So this gives us a basic characteristics of our tibia. Now if we look at the fibula, the fibula is the thin bone laterally. It's thin, long, and lateral. I may have asked you already how many have broken a fibula? Nobody? Yes. On a ski slope? Baseball. Baseball. All right. I've seen one on a ski slope, though. Somebody had fallen and had a protrusion down there, wondered what had happened, cracking that fibula. So let's look at our uh, proximal articulation. We just gave it to you. You could see it here proximally only one it can articulate with without crossing the knee. So you can figure some of these out without just memorizing. If it's got to be out here, it's got to attach to something, so it's going to be the tibia. And distally, articulation, what's it going to be articulating with? whoops, sorry, with the talus. Hmm. Sorry. So the fibula definitely is not weight-bearing. It has muscle attachments only. So if we leave then the fibula and go on down, oh, we should mention that it has a lateral malleolus. Usually that's larger. You can see it down there. Lateral malleolus. Just the swelling at the distal end. Many people make the mistake when they crack that malleolus, they say they've broken their ankle. Now you can correct them. It's a leg bone. It's not an ankle bone, right? We always used to say we broke our ankle when we were doing that as kids. It was completely wrong. So let's then look at our tarsal bones. How many tarsal bones are there? These are true ankle bones. There are seven of them. We're just going to look at two, two largest. First, the calcaneus, calcaneus, calcaneus. What's another name for the calcaneus? The heel bone. You can see how, I don't want to break him, <laughs> bring him clear up. Can you see the heel bone back here? 
It's really quite striking, isn't it? Can you see it or not? How's that? You almost want to apologize. You may be hurting him. But the point is, it is quite large, right? The calcaneus is the heel bone. What attaches to the heel bone? Everybody's heard of it. What's your big tendon back there? Your Achilles tendon. We'll see more about that when we bring in the muscle. Attaches to the calcaneus. The other bone we'll mention, we've already mentioned it. What bone did we say the tibia was articulating with? The talus, sure. So another big one is the talus. So these are our ankle bones that we're going to mention now. Let's go on to the metatarsals. Those for the sole of the foot and give just a few characteristics there. These will be the sole. There'll be five of them. We'll just give the first metatarsal is the largest because it's weight bearing. You can look at the foot. See the metatarsals and see how large. It's twice the size, the diameter of the others. So the first is the largest weight bearing. And the fifth, people usually know, because the fifth is frequently fractured. How many have broken their fifth metatarsal? There are two, three, four, five. I mean, that's most we've ever had. Any more? Six? <laughs> Seven? So definitely. How'd you do yours back there? How'd you do it? Pardon? Skating. How'd you do yours? <laughs> okay. All right. Anybody else want to share how you did it? <laughs> I did mine running down a driveway and there was a crack and I could hear it. It's called a dancer's fracture because many times during dancing the fifth metatarsal is broken. If broken equals a dancer's fracture. Now then we have the phalanges, and nothing spectacular there with our phalanges. The big toe has two, just like the thumb has two, other toes have three. But there's a great deal of difference in the flexibility of your toes versus the flexibility of your fingers. Has anybody ever tried to write with his or her toes? Yes, quite a few of you. Were you successful? Not so. But if you didn't have hands and you really had to, some disabled people have learned to write with their toes. All right. Now before we leave our long bones here, I'd like to mention something about fracture. Let's take our tibia and we're going to fracture it. <clears throat> the first thing that happens, you get severe bleeding. And form a blood clot. Put a blood clot in here. And then the second step, remember we have periosteum that's surrounding the bone. What kind of cells are in periosteum? If you had to guess, 
What do you think? Muscle cells? No. Bone cells? What kind? What's the most common tissue? Connective tissue. So we've got periosteum. which is made of connective tissue cells. And they will form fibroblasts. And fibroblasts will form osteoblasts. Osteoblasts. And osteoblasts, these are bone-forming cells. So you can figure out the meanings as we go along. And what they're going to be doing is forming fragments of bone, form fragments of bone within the clot. I don't know if we're going to be able to see them here, but we'll put some fragments. Do they show? Yes. Now this little structure that's between the ends of bones has a new name. So fragments plus clot equals a callus. So forming a callus is an essential step in repair of the bone. And then we've had bleeding, and then we had our periosteal cells as our next step forming this path. And now the periosteal cells on the outside of the bone will form osteoblasts. So our third step is osteoblast formation. on periosteum and will form bone between the two fragmented ends. Form bone between fractured ends. It's called a bony collar. So let's just put a collar of bone. So in our two-dimensional drawing, we can just do something like this, put it around. But obviously, it's going to be surrounding the whole thing. We've just cut through it, so we're only seeing it here. So in green, we have our, our bony collar. And that gives the very basics of wound healing with a, a fracture. So let's go on now to see how bo bones are joined to function. So what's the science of joints called? Arthrology, correct. So we're going to look at the science science of joints equals arthrology. So we have Many kinds of joints, we've studied them, but now we can put them together. So we can have fibrous joints, and they have just little connective tissue between the bones. Little connective tissue between bones. So who's going to tell me what's going to be my example 
of where I'm finding just a little connective tissue between bones. Think. Pardon? Say something. You're thinking. Pardon? No. That's good guess. I don't care if you guess wrong. I just want you to be thinking. Where? No? Skull. Good for you. Because look at these sutures. We said a suture is a joint between our skull bones. Very little CT there, right? So our example for a fibrous joint will be the bones of the skull, of calvarium. Now the next type of joint will be cartilaginous. And we'll have what's called fibrocartilage between the bones. Fibro, we need it strong, so we need fibers in the cartilage. Fibrocartilage between bones. Now I've given you two examples of where fibrocartilage is between bones. Who can tell them to me? The vertebrae, the intervertebral discs, fibrocartilage. Intervertebral discs. Those who are doing long jumps and really putting the body hard on the vertebra, you're very grateful you have fibers in your cartilage. Where was the other place we had fibrocartilage? Pubic symphysis, good enough. Pubic symphysis. Need to make that a strong joint. We said the pubic symphysis between the two pubic bones. Now, what's the third type of joint? Since this has been very restricted, you can see most of the bones, most of the joints in the body are the third type. You know, we've just talked about skull, vertebral disc, and pubic symphysis. So the others will be, what do we call them? Synovial joints, right. Synovial. What does it mean? Syn means with, S-Y-N, and ovial, what does it sound like? Egg, but not the yolk, but the white, egg white. So synovial fluid is like egg white, and not when it's beaten up, of course, but it's natural state. So synovial, this is egg white. So, two places that are obvious just for your review for synovial joints. Let's take the humerus, and where is it articulating? You're right, but you're not saying it. You've got your hand there. <laughs> Pardon? With the scapula, but what part of the scapula? The glenoid fossa, good for you. So the humerus with glenoid fossa is one example. Obviously we'd go around the body naming lots, but I just want to, I said I repeat and repeat, so give me another large synovial joint at the head of the femur. What's it articulating with? I mean, it's so big, and I talked about it so much. The vinegar cup, but what's it called? What's it begin with? Acid, right? Acetabulum. Say it. I want you to talk. 
Because when you get out of this class, you're going to have to use these terms. You'll say, I see them on the page, but I never used them, right? So I squeeze and squeeze to get you to talk. By the end of the semester, you're talking. Right now, you just sit with your mouths open and sort of look at me. But <laughs> I know it can be done because we do it every year and I have to work just as hard. If I have second graders and ask them, they're all talking, they're all shouting. You get inhibited, you're afraid to be wrong. And we're saying it's okay to be wrong. Speak up, what's it called? Thank you. So the femur with the acetabulum. It's only for your own good. So this is an example, again, of a synovial joint. What are the characteristics of a synovial joint? Let's go through those. So obviously we're going to have two bones coming together because it's a joint. So let's make our bones. Well, what we're going to see in our synovial joint then, first thing, will be the articular cartilage. The articular cartilage. So on the ends of the bones, we need cartilage. Characteristic of a synovial joint, we did not see this with our fibrous joint. So the first thing will be articular cartilage. It's not fibrous cartilage, however, it's what's called hyaline cartilage. We'll study cartilage shortly, but at the moment, we'll just get you started with hyaline cartilage is on the articular surface of the bones. Then the next structure will be the synovial membrane. Synovial membrane. And it will surround the joint. And again, I can only do it in 2D here, but it's around the whole joint. So we'll put in our synovial membrane. And what does a synovial membrane do? It produces synovial fluid produces synovial fluid. That's where we get the name synovial, by the consistency of the fluid. And it produces it so that it fills the synovial cavity. I'll just mark the synovial cavity with some diagonal lines. equals our synovial cavity. And we have one more structure that's involved here, and it will be the heavy connective tissue that will surround the whole joint help support this. It's called the joint capsule. It's made of connective tissue. So three will be our joint capsule. Equals heavy CT for stability and protection. Now, one other little structure that we might mention while we're building a synovial uh, joint is, anybody had bursitis? 
too young for bursitis. One has. Yes. Did you, are you an athlete? Yeah. yeah. Where'd you have it? In your hip, right. Have it hip or shoulder. It really hurts, doesn't it? What happens with bursitis is that we have bursa to sort of cushion the joints. Let's show what a bursa is. It's a little pouch. If this is my... And we'll put our synovial membrane back. But let's put on this side. We're going to have a little pouch. And this pouch, then, is called a bursa. And what it's got, it's reducing friction that the muscles around it are causing. Reduces friction from the surrounding muscles. So if we have inflammation of the bursa, what do we call it? Itis is the root for inflammation. So it's bursitis. You have meningitis. You have inflammation of your meninges. Right here, inflammation is bursitis. Inflammation of bursa. It's very painful. She had hers in her knee, their bursa in the shoulders, in various places. Not all synovial joints have bursa. So let's continue then. And what are the functions then? Obviously the functions of a synovial joint will be to reduce friction. with the synovial fluid will moisten the cartilage and nourish the cartilage. Nourish. Why is it essential to have the fluid nourishing cartilage? How does cartilage differ from bone? Does bone have blood vessels in it? You bet it has. Does cartilage? No. So you need this synovial fluid to be providing the nutrients for the cartilage. There are no blood vessels in cartilage. That's why it heals slowly. It does not have the advantage that bone has of being so rich in a blood supply. So now let's look at types of joints. We can see all the types by using the upper extremity. So types of joints. One, very simple, hinge joint. You see the hinge joint here at the elbow? Just that's hinge. What's the comparable hinge joint in the lower extremity? A hinge is to increase and decrease the angle, right? And we've given this at the elbow. We'll see the same thing with the knee. It's doing the same thing. Then we have a ball and socket joint. And we'll have a head in a depression. 
head in depression. What's the depression called in the hip? Thank you. <laughs> All right. And so the example will be just the ones that we covered. The humerus. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Glenoid cavity. Sorry. And we had the femur acetabulum. What's another kind? The pivot. When we watch the radius with its head pivot around the ulna. Pivot joint. And the example will be head of radius around ulna. We'll just give one more type. Let's give a saddle joint. A saddle joint example will be the first metatarsal. So let's have the first metatarsal. We'll have a convex surface. Metacarpal, excuse me. I apologize. This will be convex. And the carpal bone it will come to will have a concave surface. And this is concave. So these two constitute a saddle joint. Lots of kinds of joints, but it gives you an example of how we, we can classify these. So let's just look at joint movement. Again, these are easy, very straightforward, but just to put them all together, going on all the time, every time you walk, write anything. So let's look at joint movement. Easiest flexion. We're going to flex the arms, have muscles that we're flexing. So we're decreasing an angle. So what's opposite from flexion? Opposite from flexion. Extension, sure. Extension. So increase angle. Basic to know, so it's not just memorization. I mean, if I'm going to have a muscle here and it's going to contract, it's going to flex the arm, right? If I have a muscle back here and it's going to contract, it's going to extend the arm. So you don't have to memorize that the biceps flexes and the triceps extends. You can figure it out. That's what we want to teach you, to learn to just work with it. So other adduction. What does adduction mean? <coughs> Bring the limb toward the midline. Toward the midline. Here's my midline. So where's my adductor in my leg going to be? In my thigh. Right? Medial or lateral? Medial, sure. So you know the adductors are there. Easy. So adductor is toward 
midline. And contrary to take it away from the midline, what are you going to call it? Abductor. Ab with a B. Abductor. Away from midline. So we're going to study our adductors. Deltoid, here, adductor. It's going to contract, take my arm away from midline. Don't have to memorize. Figure it out. How are you going to remember which is ad and which is ab? Because when you have two things, I always try to memorize one, and then you know the other one. So adding two plus two toward adductor. Make sense? <laughs> Not sure, but I have silly little things, but I'll share them with you because years later students say, I'll never forget an adductor, two plus two, ad toward, you know. It's easy. When you're trying to figure out whether it's ab or ad, okay, enough of that one. Let's go on to the next one. I can tell by your faces you're not ready for it. But <laughs> we, the silly things you sometimes do remember. Why? What's the mechanism for memory when it's silly versus when it's not? Circumduction is the next one. Circular motion. Circumduction. Circular motion. Circular motion. Now we come to areas which will probably affect many of us in our lifetime when we get inflammation of our joints. Two types of arthritis, two big categories. You know, arthritis, itis is inflammation, arth is the joint now. You know where it comes from. So we have rheumatoid arthritis, What does room mean? Room means discharge. Room So in a joint, what's going to be discharging excessively? Synovial fluid, sure. So you know, we'll see in a moment, the characteristic of rheumatoid arthritis. The other one is osteoarthritis. Let's look quickly at the difference between these two. Now that you know the characteristics of a synovial joint, you can see just what can be affected in these, basically. So rheumatoid arthritis first. Thank you. Rheumatoid arthritis starts by a disorder of the immune system. Brought about by emotional stress. How much of that we experience, right? So what happens? You get inflammation of the synovial membrane. Inflammation of synovial membrane. So what's going to happen there? We talked about discharge. What does the synovial membrane discharge? synovial fluid. So you get an increase in synovial fluid. If you're getting an increase in synovial fluid in your joint, what's going to happen? It's going to swell, right? Have you seen arthritic joints? So we're going to, we've got inflammation here, which will then increase synovial fluid.
which will, in a swollen joint, swollen joint becomes painful. and stiff. Can't move it. Now in contrast, in osteoarthritis, we get a breakdown of the cartilage, of the articular cartilage. That's characteristic first. Breakdown of articular cartilage. So what's going to happen when you lose that cartilage? You're going to get bone against bone, aren't you? Right? Osteoarthritis. That also will be painful and no movement or different degrees of reduced movement. So it's very important to know your joints because osteoarthritis is common to all races. They found some 500,000 year old skeletons that had osteoarthritis, so it's been around for a long time. Let's just review with slides while we have a few moments here. Isn't that easy? You only have one, one to do this time. <laughs> Your job is half reduced, so let's see what we've got here. All right, what joint is this? What kind of joint is this one? Pardon? Synovial, Synovial thank you. And what bone is this? Tibia. Tibia, what bone is this? Fibula, you can see the head of the fibula articulating with the tibia. What bone is this? Femur, what are these? Condyles, great. What bone is this? Patella, what kind of bone is it? Sesamoid, good, but you can see it from a, a lateral view here, how it's articulating here with the condyle of the femur. In the next one? And here we have the whole skeleton where we'll have fibrocartilage here, fibrocartilage here, fibrous joints here, and all the rest are synovial joints. In the next one, and here we have the, an MR image of the ankle region. See all the bones you could be learning, but we're giving the tibia. What's this structure coming down here? No. You can read it. Tendon, tendon yes. <laughs> At least you can translate tendons. What tendon is coming down? The Achilles tendon. Right, because here's your calcaneus. Here's your talus. Your talus is articulating with the distal. What is it? Tibia, right? Talus, calcaneus and lots of other bones that we don't have time for. In the next one, isn't that pretty? I've never been able to project that because that's new. I wasn't sure. It'll show your fibrocartilage here. It'll give you an example of a hinge joint here, a hinge joint here, ball and socket here, ball and socket. But I just love th what they're doing with creativity and anatomy today. In the next one. And this one, I just wanted you to see how many structures are adhering to your uh, calcaneus to give strength here. Here's your fibula coming down. You can see when you get a sprained ankle versus a broken, broken what? Broken leg. This is a leg bone, not an ankle bone. Next one. And these then are your fibrous sutures in the skull. In the next one. And this is another 
I try to give you radiographs when possible because going into practice today, you'll get lots of these. What kind of cartilage is here? Come on. Fibro, thank you. What's this? Obturator foramen. What's this? <laughs> Good for you. It's the acetabulum with what in it? Head of the femur. What's this? Neck of the femur. What's this? Greater trochanter. The more you speak up here, the easier it'll be to study. You'll have it embedded through your voices rather than just through sight. In the next one, and these show the intervertebral discs. And you can see why when what, you get a slip disc, we'll have nerves coming through these in and out of the cord, which is inside, pressing on those nerves. Next one. And this will give you an example. This is the one they, what did they give? The first, it doesn't show it too well. But here you can see concavity. But these are two young bones. These have all got their epiphyseal disc. Next time we'll learn about them. That's where your bones are growing. Something's happening to my pointer. It doesn't work. There it is. Next one. And then again, we don't need this one. It's saying the same thing of the tibiofemoral joint. You've seen that. Next one. That's it. All right. Enjoy your afternoon.